Hello everybody and welcome back to another Doctor Who Big Finish audio drama review. In today's review we're going to be stepping back into the world of black and white as I'm going to be reviewing the First Doctor Adventures Volume 5 featuring David Bradley as the recast First Doctor alongside the original TARDIS team. This release is available to order now on the Big Finish website. The physical CD box set is £24.99 and the download is £19.99. The link will be in the description below to take a look at some further details details about this release. So as always with these box sets, it is in fact formatted in exactly the same way to usual, where we get two two-hour stories, so very much like the now gone monthly range. However, we have it split over four parts and both stories do two very different things. So as always, we have a starting story, which is the sci-fi episodes, so we have aliens and outer space and all things that we are used to when it comes to Doctor Who. However, the second story of the box set is a pure historical, based solely around a period piece of period characters and the Doctor being flung into this situation and needing to get out alive. And I think that it is a format that very much embraces this period within Doctor Who history. Of course, the 1960s episodes of Doctor Who, especially within the first Doctor era, do tend to favour the pure historicals. And personally, I have quite a soft spot for pure historical stories, so I do very much look forward to episodes and likes of this when a new first Doctor box set is in fact released. You give a very good taste of the era, but at the same time, if you are strongly against historical stories, I can imagine that it can be quite annoying, especially if you want to listen to the sci-fi story of the piece. But at the same time, it creates that lovely sense of variety, and through getting the perhaps safe sci-fi episode, you also get an episode in there as well that you may be pleasantly surprised by, and in fact enjoy, because a lot of the pure historical stories within this series have been very enjoyable indeed, and the episode within this box set is no exception. So taking a look at the production credits on the Big Finish website now, both of the episodes are two-hour stories, as I've already said. The first episode is written by Guy Adams, and the second episode is written by Sarah Grochala. The cover artist is Tom Webster, he's done a great job for this release as always. The director is Ken Bentley, the music and sound design is from Howard Carter, the script editor is John Dorney, and the producer is David Richardson, with the executive producers being Nicholas Briggs and Jason Haig Ellery. So of course the first thing to discuss for this release, very much like how I have done for the previous First Doctor Adventures reviews, is of course the TARDIS team themselves. Of course we have David Bradley as the First Doctor, alongside the original TARDIS team being of course Ian, Barbara and Susan. They have of course all been recast for these adventures, so it's very much like the new adventures of the First Doctor. And if you're going to these stories with the same expectations of original 60s Doctor Who, or perhaps even the early adventures, these these adventures are a little bit different. They are still very much of the style of 60s Doctor Who, as I have already mentioned. We have a sci-fi story and a pure historical. However, because we have the entirety of the main cast being recast throughout these box sets, it does have a different style. This is very much Big Finish's and David Bradley's interpretation of the first Doctor era, and as a result, personally for me, I actually find it a lot easier to listen to compared to the likes of the early adventures, which have quite a lot of visual linking narration, which more than often taken me out of the story. So if you are a fan of full cast audio drama adventures as well as 60s Doctor Who, these box sets are very much for you. So we start off with the sci-fi episode of the box set, which is For the Glory of Earth, as written by Guy Adams. And this episode is filled with lots of Guy Adams' quirky traits that you come to expect from stories that are penned by him. There are sorts of elements and personality within his scripts that is instantly noticeable as Guy Adams. I think that is something that can be quite unusual for 1960s Doctor Who because a lot of the stories within that period are very much fixed to a certain structure. And although this story does indeed have some of those structure elements in there, it still has, in fact, a bit more experimentation that I would come to expect from 60s Doctor Who. If anything, it kind of reminds me of the quirky elements from the Douglas Adams Fourth Doctor stories, however put within a 1960s Doctor Who format, as basically we have a story that is set in the future as the TARDIS team land on Earth, and Earth is a little bit unpleasant. Note that Earth is in fact spelt 
U R T H. So this isn't the Earth that we are used to. And basically it's a bit of a colony world that is a little bit barbaric and a little bit insane, clinging to what was once humanity. So we have a Doctor Who story that is all about purity and the human race and basically anybody who isn't a pure human, because obviously humans have gone out into space and kind of intermingled with other species, anybody who isn't pure human basically isn't allowed. They people that have been put into slavery in order to do jobs or even worse than that. And basically it's one of those Doctor Who stories that takes it to the extreme, which is rather nice to in fact experience again within 1960s Doctor Who, because the TARDIS team are placed into a rather difficult situation. In fact, instantly as soon as we arrive within this story, we have lots of quirky moments between the Doctor and his TARDIS team, because the Doctor is rather proud with his landing, he doesn't like to admit when he is wrong. However, they have landed in a sewer, and we have them arriving and the TARDIS team basically saying how awful the place is. However, the first Doctor is keen to try and find something about this place that is indeed pleasant, and then he drops the TARDIS key within the sewer water and basically gives up and thinks, yes, this place is absolutely awful. And it's little character traits like that that I think that stories the likes of this are very fun to listen to because of. I think this TARDIS team has very much gelled over the past few box sets and this box set and the previous box set in particular, we're starting to really see that dynamic come together. Not the same dynamic of that of the TV show, however, the original 60s team dynamic within the big finish format and within this specific recast TARDIS team. You can definitely tell that the TARDIS team, although the story is unpleasant, the characters and the actors behind are definitely enjoying portraying these roles, and as a result, as you as a listener, also enjoy the story as well. So what are the leaders of this rather unusual version of Humanity called, where we have Daddy Dominus and Mummy Marshall? And yes, I must admit I did snigger a few times within the early half of this story, because it is very over the top, and you do get to see, or hear at least, the First Doctor saying daddy, which I don't quite know what I think of that, I don't quite know what you will think of that as listeners either, but it's a very unusual story, and as I say, it has a lot of character, but it is quite over the top, because you have these people in lead roles basically domineering over everybody else within this colony of supreme human race. However, it's clearly not a supreme human race, it's people that basically don't have a clue what they are doing, and these people at the very top of power are simply idiots, and don't really quite know how to use this power, and the one way that they decide will be a good way to order people around is basically scaremongering and constantly saying that their wonderful, beautiful world filled with sewers and disaster is in fact a threat and people want to invade because of the utilities and tools that they have and the many resources on the wonderful planet of Earth. When in reality, is anybody really wanting Earth? Are they just some people who think that they are more powerful and brilliant than they are? And as a result, it's a story that kind of edges into more politics and diplomacy within the later half, which I think is quite interesting, but it is done in a way that is enjoyable. It's one of those stories I think is quite fun to listen to all the way throughout. Normally with stories the likes of this, it does seem to lack a little bit in the middle. However, throughout this story, it was well paced, it was enjoyable, and I think that the TARDIS team in particular is what brings this story to life. One of the beauties with the audio drama format is that we don't have the production errors that were of course very much present within 1960s Doctor Who, especially when it came to budget, and as you can see on the cover art for this box set, we have a rather bizarre looking creature, and that creature is Brewskin, and Brewskin actually reminds me of tardigrades. I don't know if you are aware of what they are. I think they're microscopic animals which basically can exist within these incredible climates. They can exist no matter what. They can be frozen, burnt alive, all sorts. They can be scorched and they will still survive and they're pretty much like armadillo shells, however on a tiny, tiny scale. But Bruce Skin is in fact a multi-gendered gestalt and it's a massive entity that there is multiple of them and they can kind of communicate. So you have one of the Bruce Skins with the first doctor than one of the other Bruce Skins, or the same Bruce Skin, I suppose, with Ian and Barbara. So as a result, we have this relationship being created with the TARDIS team and this alien. However, because within 1960s Doctor Who on TV, that would have been very hard to portray in an effective manner, but because it's within the audio drama format, you get used to Bruce Skin, you get relatable with Bruce Skin because they are a rather sad creature. They are trapped on the wonderful world of Earth, 
and they just kind of are a bit fed up about life because they've been put into these many different jobs, they're basically a slave, and if they stop doing the slave work, one of the other Bruce skins will be killed. And it's a very sad situation, which brings me on to the other point this story kind of raises, and it's the idea of censorship. If you live in this little microcosm society, where you have Daddy Dominus at the very top, or suppose a character very much akin to Daddy Dominus and uh, Mummy Marshall, because they have this power of their people, they have entirety of dominion, they can basically decide what the people on Earth know and what they don't know. And as a result, you have this whole idea of them modifying the actual reality of the situation, but also the people within Earth being brainwashed because of that. And gone under this leadership for so long, it's very unusual to take that leadership away. They are now there for the wider universe to explore and they don't really quite know what to do with it. I think that's an interesting concept within this story, and again, I really enjoyed seeing that play out. So overall for this story, it's fun, it's enjoyable, it's daft, it's got a few interesting elements, but the most important thing for this story for me is the TARDIS team. David Bradley has some excellent moments, and I am now picturing him as the first Doctor. I fully appreciate that he's the first Doctor, but also he has brought his own into his portrayal of the first Doctor, and I'm enjoying these adventures, and I really enjoyed sitting down and listening to this rather bizarre and unique story, but I don't think it will be for everybody. But if you're a fan of kind of Douglas Adams' quirky Doctor Who, this is very much for you. So now we move on to the pure historical of the box set, and it is The Hollow Crown, as written by Sarah Grochala, and this story is absolutely incredible. I really did enjoy it. If anything, I would go as far to say that this story is quite possibly my favourite within the First Doctor Adventures range so far. It's one of those episodes where, as soon as you click play, you carry the story through all four parts. It immerses you within this environment, all the characters really leap off the page. You get to know their problems, their likes, their dislikes, and the scenario that the TARDIS team have landed themselves within, and you get very, very invested. However, the one thing that I'm aware of when it comes to pure historical stories is that it is very much a matter of taste. There has been some other pure historicals within this series. Of course, every box set within this line so far has had one. However, there have been some that I've not particularly liked, some that I've kind of appreciated appreciated, however not fully clicked with, and then some that I've adored, the likes of this one. I think it is completely down to that historical environment that you have found yourself within, and of course in this case it is the early 1600s, and we are in Shakespearean England. So this is another Doctor Who story that does a little bit of Shakespeare, and this story does in fact have a few links to that of the Shakespeare Code. There's a number of references to the likes of Shakespeare, and the Queen having met the Doctor before and the first Doctor kind of brushes them off and kind of thinks, hmm, like he doesn't really know, because at this point within Doctor Who history, the Doctor doesn't fully appreciate that he is going to go on these many adventures throughout his many incarnations. At this point within Doctor Who history, the first Doctor is still in the very early stages of his travelling throughout the universe. He's the one setting down those early foundations. I don't think that he's fully considering the fact in the future he may get around a lot more than he originally thinks. He becomes a lot more than simply just this adventurer in space and time. I think that one of the problems with pure historical stories that a lot of people face is that it is very much one of those formats that you can go down a specific route with, and that is something that is seen within the Aztecs and the Reign of Terror, where you have the TARDIS team kind of being allocated to certain historical characters and we see the story through their eyes and their different perspectives and more than often, the likes of in the massacre as well, you have that divide between the different parties because always within pure historical episodes you have that theme of conflict. A conflict, it warps in the massacre on the horizon, the reign of terror for example of course, and you have them coming together and you have the companions and the doctor on different sides and they are trying to maintain history or something has happened that is questioning the path of history and they need to 
tie it all back together. And I can imagine that if that's something that you're not particularly interested in, why you may not like or enjoy historical stories as much, because once you have experienced the format, it is pretty much the same format again, but in a different setting. But this story gets a bit more personal. I like the fact that we have Shakespeare, who was writing his plays, and a specific person in the story wants him to act out a certain version of King James with an execution scene within it. However, he refuses due to it being possibly against the Queen herself, and of course being used as a way to stir up a political upheaval that is then going to overthrow the Queen. Dealing with the later variation of the Queen, who's a lot older by this point, many people wondering who her replacement is going to be. Due to her not being seen within the public eye for quite some time, some people believe that she has been replaced by the people within her office, in particular Cecil, and he is the one calling the shots. And I'm not going to reveal the ending of this story, but I just love the way it immerses you within this narrative. Of course, we get to see uh, Jude Shakespeare, as portrayed by Lauren Cornelius, and basically Jude is this very intriguing character. He is in fact a girl, however, she's playing a boy, because of course females cannot play on the stage of the Globe Theatre, so she's pretending to be all of these characters, and it's kind of the reverse of what you get to see in theatre. Usually it's normally males playing females, however, this time we have it the other way around, and I love the way that we're following her throughout the story, dealing with her own personal problems, because she is very much a young character. We have Susan kind of relating to her, but this story, I must admit, still has those traits that Susan has within the TV show. She can get a little bit whiny at times, a little bit sort of attached onto certain aspects and certain characters, and as a result, I can imagine that she may become infuriating to some, but that said, I think that Claudia Grant does a very, very good job of remaining faithful to the Susan within the TV show, because that rather whiny character is what we also get on TV. Of course, likewise, Ian and Barbara have some excellent moments throughout this story as well, because Barbara is a history teacher. Ian just generally very much, I think, enjoys historical stories. He enjoys getting his hands dirty and a little bit of a sword fight here and there. As much as he's kind of against it, I think he kind of enjoys it. But Barbara is a character who knows all about history, and of course, Big Finish have managed to develop her character to give her more focus. She is able to present the situation. She is able to tell the listener what is going on, filling in a little bit of context and a bit of narrative and historical education that you got within 1960s Doctor Who. In fact, a theme that is used throughout both of these stories is at the very end, we have a rather nice slow ending that summarises the story. We say goodbye to certain characters. We have the different members of the TARDIS team kind of filling in the plot as in what happens next. A little summary that kind of puts a nice bow on the story overall, a fitting conclusion that is very, very enjoyable, as I say, to listen to and watch unfold. Something about the imagery within this story as well, I think that is solely down to David Bradley's The First Doctor, because naturally, on our screens, The First Doctor did have a few bumbling moments where William Hartnell, sadly, due to his poor health in the later years, struggled to get out certain lines. However, this version of The First Doctor is much quicker, much sharper, and as a result, we get to see or dig a bit deeper into this Doctor's feelings. I think that David Bradley does an incredible job throughout this story. Again, I would dare say that this is in fact one of his best performances, and I couldn't help but imagine this story in my mind and sort of the streets around the Globe Theatre, these people stirring up these fights and riots and protests in order to protect the Queen. Shakespeare within the mix as well, and the Doctor on a boat on the Thames of the Queen. It's got so much lovely, beautiful imagery that I find myself finishing this story thinking, you know what, that is a really good Doctor Who adventure, and that is what I like about pure historicals. This is an example to me as to why I love this format, very much like why I love the likes of The Massacre of St. Bartholomew's Eve, as well as The Reign of Terror. It gave me those vibes. I really appreciated this story. And again, a compliment that I can extend to both of the stories within this box set is that they're not necessarily fast-paced. They do have action moments, but it's slow in delivering the story. It takes time to introduce the various characters, the likes of Shakespeare, Jude 
Shakespeare, the Queen, the Earl of Essex, Lady Rich, and a number of other subsidiary background characters as well. It takes time to really delve into the plot, and as a result, for me as a listener, I really enjoyed it, and a similar compliment can also be said for the first story within this box set as well. These scripts take time, they simmer, but as a result, I really enjoyed watching both episodes unfold. In fact, come to think of it, you can kind of make a drinking game out of pure historical Doctor Who stories because you've got a key historical figure, a secret tunnel, the rise of some conflict, Ian Chesterton has a fight, Susan starts crying or gets attached to a certain character within the story, and the First Doctor ends up in a sticky situation that may or may not nearly end up in his execution. That is kind of the fundamental elements of a Pierre Strockhall story, but I like the fact that this episode gets gritty. It's a bit dark in moments, characters that are rather good-hearted have the possibility of death, however at the very end we have a little Doctor who twist in there as well, the likes of, yes we're going to maintain history, however in the way the Doctor wishes to. He's going to tamper a little bit, not too much, but generally makes a positive and come for everyone. It leaves a nice taste in the mouth at the very end, a nice positive message, but also something that Ian and Barbara mention as well. How do we know what we learn in history is in fact the truth? It's all dependent on the person who has delivered that narrative, who has lived through those times. I think that's a very interesting comment to leave the hollow crown on. It's one of those things where history is very much a personal thing of what you are interested in, and this story is basically a direct example of that. So in conclusion, for the First Doctor Adventures Volume 5, I think that this box set does have a little bit for everyone. We have the sci-fi story and the pure historical, and both episodes are in fact thoroughly enjoyable. They both have some very good moments, in particular the Hollow Crown is the main highlight for me, but that said, The Glory of Earth is also a good story as well, with some very humorous and funny moments. So if you are a fan of 1960s Doctor Who, this box set is a very strong one indeed, and possibly my favourite of the range so far. I must admit there's sometimes one story that I really like, and another that is a little bit of a dud in parts, but I think that this time round, in fact, both stories are very, very strong, very much like the pre previous volume within this series as well. As I said before, the more this series goes on, the more I think the main TARDIS team are really flourishing. So yes, if you're looking for something a bit different, a little bit sci-fi, a little bit historical, then yeah, I most certainly recommend considering this one, because it has some great moments. If you're a historical fan, The Hollow Crown is an essential listen. And Sarah Gorchala, I want you to write a new series pure historical story for either the Ninth or Tenth Doctors, because they've been on Big Finish now, or at least the Tenth Doctor has, for quite a while. We need them to dip their toes finally and deliver the first ever new series pure historical. It needs to happen, please, and I want Sarah Grochala to write it. So thank you very much for watching this review, I really hope you have enjoyed it. Do of course stay tuned on the Host Productions for brand new Doctor Who content each and every week. Of course, on that note, I shall see you all next time. Bye for now.